Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Springfield at the Research and Collection Center of the Illinois State Museum with a very interesting story about zoology, natural history, the animal kingdom, and family, if you can believe it or not. Meredith, family does play into this because what attracted me to this story was the, the Biggs family from San Joe's, Illinois, who donated many years ago um, a collection to yes. the Illinois State Museum. And I asked you if you would, and you went to a lot of work to pull out much of the collection. But we'll tell the family story as we get into this. But first, I want to see some of these animals. Biggs sure, was a taxidermist yes. and a pretty darn good one, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Uh, Biggs developed a, and began this taxidermy collection starting in the late 1890s uh, and built it up, focusing a lot on critters that he found around his home in San Joe's, Illinois. Um, although it expanded and he was able to bring in and, and obtain material from other parts of the country and even other countries as well. Um, so it became quite a diverse collection of taxidermy yeah. mounts. And when it was gifted to the Illinois State Museum, it was was more than 200 specimens. Three or th over 300 over specimens 300 total. Specimens. Yeah, birds and mammals, a other mixture of cr other little critters, lizards are in there as well. Yeah. Uh, primarily birds and mammals, yeah. though. And as we'll tell this family story, it wasn't just him. His daughter, his great granddaughter, mm -hmm. were also involved. They yes. were taxidermists. So it's very, it's a very interesting. Uh, multifaceted story. Exactly. But first, let's look at some critters sure. because that's what makes this whole thing really interesting. And, uh, it, and this is the biggest possum this, I have ever seen. I agree. This <laughs> possum, we've had to bring him out. He's quite spectacular, and and I'm and to some extent, you're glad that he's not running around loose in here no because kidding. he's such a beast of an animal. Um, this is definitely this is this this possum specimen is actually one of the mounts that came to the Biggs collection. Um, they they were they had material donated to them. Mm -hmm. um, this family of a pack taxidermist who lived in Pekin, Illinois, Frank Eisenberg, when he passed away, his family donated his uh, oh, personal okay. taxidermist collection. So taxidermy was a hobby, actually, a large number of people had this as a hobby mm -hmm. in, the, in the air, late 1800s into the early part of the 1900s. Um, and small museum collections, they talk, people talked amongst themselves, traded specimens. So we were able to, the Biggs family obtained other uh, taxidermy mm -hmm. mounts to be part of their collection. Now, yeah. I didn't know this until you told me. This flying squirrel here, yep. I had no idea that they existed in Springfield and around central Illinois, yes, but they, they do. Yes, they do. Yep, so and that's nice. It's nicely displayed, actually, in, in flight, gliding down. So these guys, they're nocturnal, and they do get from tree to tree uh, by gliding, and mm -hmm. they extend this uh, uh, fur-lined um, skin flaps, essentially, mm -hmm. that are from their, from their front to their hind legs. Their tail is also flattened. And they use it as a rudder when they're steering um, from tree to tree. But this is, these are North American and, and Illinois yeah. species And as we well. don't see them because they come out at night and exactly. they're probably very quiet. I mean, it's not like they're flapping their wings or anything. They're exactly. just gliding, they're right? Moving from tree to tree. Yeah. We have um, and this, oh, this is a monstrous porcupine. And we don't, we don't have porcupines around no, here. No, they're more they? of a northern species, uh, north of Illinois uh, in, in pine forests and things like that. Uh, I like him partly because he's such a cute little guy. Um, he's got a great face on him and he's, and he's an impressive, <laughs> this is a, one of the largest rodents in North America and it's nice to have such a, a, a well-mounted specimen of a porcupine. Yeah, B Biggs was was pretty darn good. Now while we have time here I want to show a picture of Mr. Biggs. This is Oliver S. Biggs and the reason we're showing this picture right now is because the skunks that we will see next are actually part of this picture. Now this was he was uh, he was this is about 1920 and San Joe's is up on the uh, Logan Mason County line, about 50 miles mm -hmm. north of Springfield. And these very, uh, very uh, skunks here are the ones that, that we just saw, right? Exactly. So we have <laughs> the mama skunk, <laughs> theoretically, this is the mama, and then uh, the, the babies. And he really did pride himself on the naturalism of the pose. As you saw in the photo, it looks like the little family of skunks are, mm -hmm. are in the grass there. And then as they came into the museum, then they've been placed on these boards to display. But we're able to, we do have a couple other little skunks tucked away. Um, but it's nice to have a, the age range of, of, of these animals shown as well, not just different species, but mm -hmm. you have different sizes, and, and you can sort of show mm -hmm. more about their biology by having a group of them rather than just a single animal. Just behind the skunk, we see a fox. And, and Biggs liked to do this. He tried to put his animals in a natural circumstance, didn't he? And this one's got has caught a bird of some type. Yeah, so it's, this is a fox, a red fox, with a prairie chicken. And it is showing kind of part of the natural behavior of the animal um, hunting the, the native birds. And it adds a little bit more to the life-like 
um, a pose and gives you more of an appreciation of what these animals were doing even though you're seeing them mm -hmm. uh, in a museum you're seeing some aspects of their behavior in these mounts. Yeah. Now we just saw a picture of Biggs uh, but a big player in the story too was his daughter. Yes, Hazel. Hazel. And back in the 80s when this, don't, when this uh, collection was gifted to the museum uh, there was a cover article in your magazine, The Living Museum, about the family. Yes. This is Hazel. Right. Okay, tell, tell me the family so Hazel, story. Hazel, Hazel, O.S. Biggs learned taxidermy from his mother, and then as he grew and became more, uh, developed his taxidermy and had a family, he passed on this skill and taught his daughter Hazel to also um, become a taxidermist. Mm -hmm. And she had this as part of, as a hobby and eventually as a career herself. Um, and when O.S. Biggs passed away, he asked her to continue on the family tradition. He had this collection that he had in his home that he actually used for tour group, tours for school groups in the third floor of their, you know, uh -huh. the attic of their house was where this collection was initially displayed. And so when he passed away in 1947, he asked Hazel to continue on this, this tradition and, and presentation of this material. Um, which she did do. She'd raised her own family by that point and kind of came back to taxidermy as kind of her role in the community. She also did have her own taxidermy business where she she mounted critters for people as well as for the museum oh, over darn. time. Well, this is interesting because we look at this picture here. This is Hazel standing in front of the museum, right? And you could see that she's got the sign up and, and ready to, to welcome guests. And then the bottom picture actually shows some of the young folks that uh, that would have been going through. And they kept this museum going mm -hmm. for a long time. Well, so she, in the 1950s, Hazel built a freestanding building um, to house the collection and dedicated it to her father as the O.S. Biggs Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm. And yes, it, it did, that was became a, a destination for school groups, not just from San Joe's, but from the whole area. School groups would come for tours. Hazel was very... Um, uh, aware of her role as a teacher and an educator, so she had actually a library in there with books and magazines, and she kept up to date on knowledge and information. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just look at these animals; it was she was telling people about them and teaching yeah. the, the kids who came through about the animals as well as about taxidermy. That art of taxidermy, she felt, was kind of a key part of what she was conveying to people as well. And then the school districts in San Jose eventually became the keeper of the museum yes, because did. the family couldn't do it anymore. Exactly. So um, Hazel passed away in 1960. Her granddaughters actually ran the museum for a few more years following that, but then it went exclusively to San Joe's school system, and they kept it for classes. Science classes would go. Um, basically, you know, they would see these animals, learn to identify animals, learn about animals uh, from their area, but that went on until the late 80s uh, when the school system basically could not maintain the collection anymore. It was mm -hmm. a financial um, issue to some extent, and, you know, and, and Focuses change, I think, too. So they they look for something else. What can we do with this these specimens? They are uh, part of the history of San Joe's mm -hmm. too, um, and what can be done with them to preserve them as well. Yeah. And that's when they, they they came to the museum here to the Illinois State Museum in 1989. Well, let's see some more of them. Sure. All right, let's go that way. Right. <laughs> well, Meredith, obviously, not everything that was in Big's collection came from Central Illinois, <laughs> as we can see from this shark's mouth. Yes, these are sand tiger shark jaws, Ooh. and there was a more of a diversity. Clearly, the, the central Illinois uh, birds and mammals were the core of the collection, but, yeah. but the Biggs Museum did bring in material from other places. People, family, uh, families and, and townsfolk went on vacation, and they would bring things back and donate them to the mm -hmm. museum, um, and they obtained some, some other collections from other, other taxidermists and things like that. I would say these, these shark jaws are, are they're very cool, and they certainly are, but they're one of the yeah. more unusual items um, that was on display in the Biggs museum. I bet you could scare some kids uh, with, with that with that example right We've there. We've used them as a Halloween display uh, mm -hmm. before too so we do try to bring out some of these and show them um, in some of our educational and, and fun events. I, I um, always heard that, that sharks have these layers you know layers mm -hmm. of teeth and I never but I never saw them. Oh yeah oh, and these are a great example because you've got yeah. all those teeth <laughs> in these rows. Yeah. If the first one doesn't get you the yes. next one will. Okay, and we, we mentioned that Oliver S. Biggs and Hazel his daughter worked together on things what a beautiful specimen yes. this peacock this is. This peacock, huh? and we know that, that this was one that Oliver, that O.S. Biggs mounted with Hazel's assistance. So it's a really lovely specimen mm. that they worked on together. And it's really nice to have that connection to the family in, the, in this particular mount. It, it is really spectacular. I love showing it to people. But she was a good student, too, because, and, and if you want to, oh, sure. can we pick up the pheasant? Yeah. Because this is one of her mounts. And, uh, and she did a very nice 
a nice job. So this is a ringneck pheasant that Hazel mounted herself. It's a little bit hard to deal with. This. Yeah, tail the feathers are. Just, but again, posing extremely in a nice natural pose for this guy, mm -hmm. and and highlighting his beautiful tail feathers. Um, and and she, a kind of a natural mount. Yeah, the base has got a little bit more. Um, it's degraded over time, but it was des designed to show more sort of a green and, and look a little bit more mm -hmm. natural than the bases of some of the other mounts. So she was trying to. The presentation was part of, of the of this mount as well. Mm -hmm. He's very handsome. Earlier. You, you mentioned that not only Hazel, but her granddaughter, Biggs's great granddaughter, was also a collector and true. with insects. Yes, true. And some of those came to the collection yes, as well. Yes, we do have insects from the collection that, that Hazel's yeah. granddaughter, O.S. Biggs's great granddaughter, uh, mounted for display in the collection. Well, we're going to see those next. Dr. Tim Cachette, you've seen more than a few moths in your day. How, how did yes. Marizelda, the great granddaughter, do? <laughs> um, Marizella did very well for the local common uh, insects. Uh, it's a good display of sphinx moths that occur. Sphinx, in, sphinx moths. Yeah, or hawk moths. Hawk moths, okay. Hawk, hawk moths. Hawk. Yeah, most of these actually come out uh, at dusk, so they're common insects that you will see flying around, uh, petunias and your household plants. This, this one really looks like a hawk. You can see why they would call it that. It, it, it doesn't. It, it looks like a red-tailed hawk. <laughs> actually, actually, when they fly, uh, and most of them fly at dusk, uh, mm -hmm. except for the, the uh, uh, what's called hummingbird moths or bumblebee mm -hmm. moths. These are diurnal, but the rest are nocturnal. Mm -hmm. And uh, they look like hummingbirds. Often people mistake them for hummingbirds flying around there. They are that big, yeah. yeah, yeah. They are very large. You know, this 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 grand, great granddaughter was very interesting. She she at the age of fifteen was was doing this and actually started manning the museum for them. But this is interesting because it's in her own handwriting. All these little specimens are in her handwriting, and she did a pretty good job of preserving them, didn't she? Yes, Mary Zelda continued the family tradition with insects, which mm -hmm. uh, apparently was uh, a, a little new to to what they'd been doing before with the birds, and mammals, and mm -hmm and reptiles. But uh, here again, these are also common things that you'd find around. They did uh, branch off and, and uh, also uh, do some collecting in Florida. On I'll family, hold that one for you. On family trips. Uh, these are Florida species that were collected oh, so she on would family bring them vacation. back with her, huh? Brought them back. <laughs> uh, and it's easy to preserve these things in these kinds of display cases. Uh, they're they're bought by uh, biological supply houses. They're called Riker mounts. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're just flat mounts, cardboard, black frame. They're pinned on the side with glass tops and with a cotton background. Mm -hmm. So when the insects are dried, they carefully dry them. And you dry them in the position that you want them displayed yeah. in. Yeah. Just lay them on the cotton there, put the top down on that. And uh, if to preserve them a little more if you put uh, mothballs or some sort of insect repellent under the cotton, it preserves them for, for Keeps the other insects out, time. huh? Yes. Here's another couple of examples. I like these because, again, these show that, that uh, she has classified and categorized these on her own with her own uh, little tags and her own handwriting. Yeah, these are all grasshoppers and crickets that mm -hmm. she's, that she's uh, <laughs> preserved here. And there's a, there's a large assortment of uh, for here also, uh, she has she has flies and she beetles, was busy. And, uh, all kinds of beetles. Gracious, here. she was busy. All common things that that you would see uh, around your house. Mm -hmm. Now this is a place that the public rarely gets to see, the research and collection center and this collection you got back here, Bonnie. It's 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 fearsome <laughs> as, we, as we look at this female lion with her uh, with her jaws ready to snap. <laughs> it's a fabulous collection, oh, actually, is. and actually a lot of people do see it. We have about twenty thousand people come through the do research you really? and, and these collection are on tours, center. I guess, huh? So we have a lot of behind the scenes tours for school kids, um, fifth grade and up. We'd like to send the younger ones over to the museum because the exhibits there are more suitable for right. their age group. And we have open houses for members. We've had some public mm -hmm. open houses. A lot of groups will tour here, special yeah. groups like Red Hat societies, things like that. Yeah, yeah. So you welcome them.
that. You welcome we do people, welcome, right? yeah. yeah. But it's not like they can just walk in the door. No, they have to have an appointment to come in. And, and by have a appointment. Group. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But it, it really is a great collection. And the reason I wanted to talk to you about this is because we've been talking about the Biggs collection. Right. And a lot of this stuff comes to the museum from people who just donate. They just, yeah. they have a collection. They no longer can use it or they're, they die or, or, you know, people inherit it and they don't care about it and they want to know where to take it. And a museum's a good place to go with it, isn't it? Absolutely. And that's especially true for the mounted animals and zoology collections that the bulk of them actually come from private donations mm -hmm. from Illinois citizens. Also from transfers from uh, universities. We have some mounts that came to us from University of Illinois as well when they closed their Natural History Museum. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the private donations from citizens and then orphan collections where an individual, often a private individual, will establish a small museum like the O.S. Biggs Museum yeah, yeah. that you heard about. Yeah. And then when um, they can no longer care for the collection, they start looking for a home. So we call those kinds of collections orphan collections. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we're happy to take those collections because they're very important collections. You can see how important the Biggs collection yeah, is. Yeah. And we can take that collection and preserve it, use it in educational programs, exhibits, sometimes in research. So we provide a home for it on a long-term yeah. basis. You know, this whole topic came to my attention because I was in Decatur doing a story about endangered species. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the species, of course, no longer endangered, extinct, was the passenger pigeon. Right. And over there was this specimen that was done by O.S. Biggs, and it was the last killed passenger pigeon from 1901, and it was killed near Oakford, Illinois, which is close to Petersburg. And it ended up in the Millican collection, and, and we had a professor telling the story of this last killed passenger pigeon. And I thought to myself, well, who the heck was Biggs? And then I come to find out that Biggs, it's the same Biggs that has gifted you with these 200 specimens. So it's an interesting story, an interesting family. It's a great story, and it's a story of family taxidermists, which mm -hmm. I think is just fascinating, passed down from mother yeah. to son to his daughter and then to her granddaughters, mm -hmm. which is a fabulous story. And, you know, the passenger pigeon example you're giving is a perfect example of how important some of those early taxidermists were. I mean, if he hadn't preserved that mount, they wouldn't have it to show today right. at Millican. Right, and they're not making any more passenger pigeons. No, that's, you know, in fact, this is the 100th anniversary of the extinction of the passenger pigeon, and this is the year that's of the passenger right. pigeon. right. The last one died in 1914, isn't that in right? In the Cincinnati Zoo. Yeah. We have a fine mount of a passenger pigeon on exhibit in the Illinois State Museum. And we also show um, flocks of recreated flocks of passenger yeah. pigeons in the exhibition. Yeah. Well, people should see that because they, th th there weren't millions, there were billions of passenger pigeons, and they say that they would darken the sky when, when a flock of them would go over. Yeah, in fact, there's a tremendous quote that relays a story like that under the oak tree and the changes exhibit in the public museum. Okay. Well, we don't mind you giving it a plug. That's terrific. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to. <laughs> Meredith, shortly after the Illinois State Museum got this collection, the biggest collection, they had an exhibit of the collection, and this prairie chicken exhibit was in it. Yes, we wanted to display these taxidermy examples, um, partly to, to show the family collection, this always biggest collection, but also to highlight some of these lovely examples of taxidermy, this is these prairie chickens date to the 1890s um, and are, I think, just a spectacular example of taxidermy showing this male and female prairie chicken with their um, their clutch of little hatched chicklings. <laughs> I'm not sure what they're <laughs> chicks, I guess, <laughs> um, you know, that they have around them in this in this sort of natural yeah. looking habitat. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because what he's done is he's shown how camouflaged those little chicks are because every time you, you look at them, you kind of come up with a different number, Exactly, they're really cryptic. They're really hidden mm -hmm. in this little grass um, plant matter that he's put in there and it really shows how in the natural environment you, these little babies yeah. would be able to be hidden from possible well, predators. he was good. He yeah, was this good. is a lovely, lovely example of taxidermy from and the late right 1800s. And then right next to it, you've got this massive golden eagle. Now, yep. I don't think he probably found this in Illinois, but no. I guess there was a time when they were here. I don't know. Sure, they are around nowadays. Um, this this particular golden eagle specimen is from Colorado. Oh, um, and wow. again, Biggs uh, mounted this. I don't know the 
date, but certainly it would have been um, in the early part of the 1900s, potentially. Um, and then next to it, well, it's it's. It's pretty, I think it's just pretty spectacular. I love the way it's posed with its wings outspread. Mm -hmm. uh, where next to it is an immature bald eagle. So this, this guy is not showing the white head that you see in the adults. Mm -hmm. You can see that they are, they're both are also a spectacular bird, but even that the golden eagle is actually a bigger bird than the bald eagle yeah. um, in these mounds. And then, and then again, back to the family angle again, we've got a precious picture here of Hazel w posing with these two, uh, with these two mounts. And uh, I, I assume that he mounted them, but maybe she had a hand in it too, because they did work together, didn't they? Yes, and, and Biggs's name is on the Golden Eagle Mount, and I think he probably mounted both of them. Mm -hmm. It's definitely highly possible that Hazel helped him. She was a real big fan and advocate for eagles. They weren't always popular with people. Probably they are predators mm -hmm. um, and, and would go after um, sheep oh, and lambs, cows. sure. And, exactly. Yeah. So people weren't always as fond of them as we really are a lot more attached to them nowadays. And, and Hazel in the 50s would part of her when she talked to school groups and anybody and I read a newspaper article and the news writer was saying you know he came away from this discussion with her a big fan of eagles after hearing mm -hmm. Hazel talk about them and explain how um, important they are and, and just sort of the noble animals and that was part of her a, a kind of a mission that she felt she really wanted to, people to change their opinions at the time to be more positive towards eagles yeah. um, yeah. When you when you have all these specimens, particularly birds like this, that take up a lot of space, you can't always keep them mounted the way that Biggs had them mounted. You gotta you gotta this find space for them, and then you have to store them, categorize them, and all that. So let's look at that process a little bit, okay? Sure. We're we're kind of back in the stacks now, aren't we, Meredith? Yes, I indeed, guess. in the bird collections. In the in the bird collection, and this we we're talking about the difficulty in storing these things because. If you have a taxidermist who gives you a mount, you can't don't have space for all that. Exactly, and they do take up a lot more space when they're posed naturally. Um, and then also, as a mission, as a museum, our mission is to preserve these specimens and keep them in good condition. So mm -hmm. often, keeping them out and on display is not necessarily the best storage conditions too. So we want to get them into better storage conditions. Um, but even that becomes a little bit of an issue because yeah. they're posed. Yeah. Um, is this a good example? Sure, yes, this is actually a really great example. These are harriers, northern harriers, which are mm -hmm. state endangered species in Illinois. Uh, the males are, are gray and the females have this uh, rusty brown color. And then this specimen here, we can get him out. This is a male harrier. Um, this is one of the specimens from the Biggs collection that mm -hmm. OS Biggs collected in 1936. They're state endangered. So this is, again, this helps us have a record of the species mm -hmm. that today has a, a conservation interest in the state and we can extend the records back to the 30s. We know it was collected around St. Joe's area mm -hmm. um, as well. I, I assume there were more of them then than there are now. Yes, huh? indeed. Yeah, yeah. Probably in habitat animal. issues, you know, the places where they like to feed over prairies. They are beautiful animals. Yeah. Um, a lot of that's agriculture now. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's carefully put him back. I yeah. Tuck him into Full. bed there. Exactly. Right. And let's, I'm going to close this to give us some more room. These are starlings. Oh my goodness. Starlings are not native to North America. They're, they, they were introduced um, in the late 1800s on the East Coast. And then this starling, which has got a really lovely... And we got gobs of them now, oh, right? Oh, we have so many of them now. But this guy was collected in 1929, again, near St. Joe's by O.S. Biggs um, and mounted. Um, mm -hmm. This, in 1929, these were not very common in Illinois, and so this is a very early he record. He was probably thrilled to have one. Exactly. It was yeah. like, this is a cool bird. It's a new species. It's coming into Illinois. Mm -hmm. People didn't necessarily think the same way you know, we think about them today as well, but yeah. they're documenting the existence and the presence of these species as they moved. You know, starlings have moved all the way across yeah. North America, but at the time, this was not as common, and it was, it was a record. It was, it was documenting this presence of this interesting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting I mean, We didn't actually write a rather lovely mount too, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to shove that back right. in. Okay. And we were talking about endangered species. Exactly. Um, let me pull this out here. This, these are a lot of the sage hens and, and prairie chickens oh, in these man. cabinets. And what we have here are is an example of a ruffed grouse. This is a 
these are actually extirpated. They've been wiped out of Illinois. There aren't any populations here anymore, mm -hmm. um, but we have this specimen. And the reason we know it's from, well, it's from the Biggs collection. We know he collected in his, around his hometown in near San Joe's, but also because of the, the coloring of the tail feathers is kind of a rusty color that's characteristic of Illinois populations. Uh -huh. So we're able to tie this back based on its color, on the known color variation to being also from an Illinois population. And again, representing species that are not part of our native fauna anymore, but mm -hmm. that Bakes was able to preserve and display in his museum collection. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it does give you, it gives you an idea of what you all have to deal with, with the space limitations mm -hmm. that anybody would have, oh, yes. no matter what, how, oh, how yes. big your so collection so was. Much space. And then it's remarkable. When we, you know, receiving this Bakes collection, there's so much diversity in it, but then some of these individual specimens are, are, are valuable for multiple reasons, you know, for conservation interest mm -hmm. as well as education interest. We really do try our best to find good storage solutions and, and, and keep them in as good a shape as they are when we receive yeah. them as well. In the 1950s, Hazel Biggs Palmer put this collection together. And it's a favorite of the school kids who come through the Research and Collection Center of the Illinois State Museum. In fact, some of the Biggs birds and other animals are probably on exhibit somewhere in the country, or will be soon at one of the six facilities of the Illinois State Museum. With another Illinois Story in Springfield, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.